Hello, Vermonters. Thank you, as always, for listening to me. I hope that um, we can have a, an ongoing dialogue. And something that I've really talked about a lot is bringing moderate Democrats and moderate Republicans together to solve the problems that most concern Vermonters. And the opioid crisis and the, the fentanyl sweeping our state is a big one. I ran on that issue when I ran for governor. And this all started for me. I thought I was asked to talk about this. Um, this is actually an extremely emotional issue for me uh, because I've really worked a lot with people in drug addiction. And for me, it started in the 1970s when I was about 14 or 15. And I actually spent quite a bit of time because I lived in East Hartford, Connecticut. I also spent time in Hartford. And I knew people then who were methadone users at the methadone clinic personally. And also I would see them in Hartford, Connecticut. And their teeth were falling out and they couldn't live their life without getting their daily methadone. And it hasn't got better. In a 1981 article I read, it was actually an essay that I read in a, in a, a, a basic English uh, class that I was required to take. It recited that a dose of heroin cost $100, and, that, and that's in 1981 dollars, um, and that that was the biggest reason for the crime involved with the drug issue, the, the drug addiction was because people who needed $100 a day were stealing cars and uh, boom boxes and breaking into houses to get $100 a day. This comes up in a little while. In 1986, I wrote and published my first article that I ever wrote for the Connecticut Law Tribune. We were in the midst of an AIDS epidemic. And the article was called Give Addicts Clean Needles. I was advocating that we should allow needle swap centers because at that time, the number one vector, if you will, um, aside from, well, most of the people with AIDS were in the gay community, but the number one vector for people to get into the heterosexual community uh, were prostitutes and also drug users, often in overlap there. And at the time, there was a huge prejudice against drugs. And in fact, the New York City police had said they'd arrest anybody who showed up at the um, at the needle exchange clinic that the health department had set up. And that seemed a little bit um, cross-purpose. So I wrote an article about that. Um, from 1992 to about 19, in 1998, I worked as a criminal defense attorney in Connecticut, and I was a special public defender. So I was assigned to dozens and dozens of clients who were arrested for large quantities of heroin or crack cocaine, hand-to-hand -hand sales. I had clients who had, I had one client who had uh, 400 bags of heroin um, on his person within a month of having been caught and charged with having 400 bags of heroin both times. That's a lot of heroin. And so I saw firsthand um, the, the drug culture and the drug war. And I opposed the drug war because it wasn't working. And, the, and, and as a conservative, um, you know, sometimes I think still we have to accept what we can and cannot do. Um, it doesn't work necessarily to incarcerate people or drug users. So around 2017, I think it was, I saw an article on Vermont Digger that said the average cost for a dose of heroin here in Vermont was $6. And I became physically ill when I realized the implications of that. That meant that, of course, people were using heroin. It just, uh, now it was, instead of $100, it's so cheap that it's cheaper than a six pack of even not very good beer. Cheaper than mar a marijuana addiction. So cheap that it, it was a, a huge lure for people of low income, people in despair. In the Great Depression, guess what happened? What, what went up in consumption? Alcohol went up. Because people, when they're stressed, they tend to turn to substances that help them feel uh, some escape from the reality of the world. And when we study in the Recovery Coach Program here in Vermont, which I highly recommend, it's a one-week course, um, it's generally free. And I went and took it because when I read that, I was like, you can't expect government to solve this problem. Drug addiction is more than just an addiction problem. It's a housing problem. It's a work problem. It's an extended family problem. And I realized that unless I and others got out there and became recovery coaches and worked to help and support people, that we were never going to solve this problem. There isn't a government big enough with enough money to do that. It literally would have to take over all of our lives. Now, the recovery coach program here through PEAR in Vermont has since become woke so it's all about race now. So I don't know how good it is. I, I'm, I don't think that drugs really care what color you are. And of course, we see that also in our police who are alleged to be racist for arresting uh, people dealing fentanyl and heroin that's killing people, the, the large number of them coming from 
Hartford and New York City and Springfield and Detroit and Chicago. We see them come here over and over, just read the papers, and then they go home again. We just had a big bust in Roxbury. Uh, the guy had two pounds of crack plus fentanyl and heroin, and he was allowed to go back to Hartford. But if the police arrest him, they're immediately labeled, oh, look, statistically, you're arresting black people, you're a racist. That's racism, by the way. Uh, that's systemic racism by progressives who are the true racists. Now, when I studied as a recovery coach and when you study these subjects, it's pretty obvious that the number one indicator for why someone becomes a, uh, an opioid addict, uh, an opioid substance abuser, is ACEs or adverse childhood experiences. And because of childhood trauma, people, we know this causes more addiction. How about we stop, start to stop the causes of these addictions? Well, a lot of that has to do with broken families, fatherless homes. Um, as many black conservatives will show, uh, the, the movie um, Uncle Tom is a great movie to show that well-intentioned liberal policies to help people in the inner cities, uh, aid to families with dependent children amongst them, literally paid people financially to not get married. And fatherhood just plummeted in popularity and in actuality in our inner cities for black and white uh, children. But uh, those were predominantly um, inner city uh, BIPOC communities. I know this too because my mom was a DCF worker in the state of Connecticut for almost 20 years dealing with child abuse cases. And she, as a Democrat, will tell you that that program was horribly destructive of the family. If there's no father, there's no protection, there's no provision, and there's a nurturing that's missing that we should validate in our society rather than denigrate men for being men. I see some great dads out there right now picking up where some women or moms have not been there. So it's really not about gender either. So yet the progressives have it all upside down. I was at a recovery coach meeting two years ago when I ran for governor and Dave Zuckerman spoke. He's not a recovery coach. And I heard the same malarkey from him in a recent email where he says, oh, we have to destigmatize opioids. And the biggest thing we should do is build more housing for people in recovery and get rid of their criminal records and, and have more jobs for them. Well, if people had more jobs, and more, better, more affordable housing, then many of them wouldn't turn in despair for $6 a day habits, okay? And um, now we're giving out supposedly free fentanyl strips. I don't know that we give out free insulin strips. People have to pay for those. Um, people have to pay for their insulin. We're all paying for the medically assisted treatments. We're all paying for the suboxone and methadone um, out of taxpayer funds. And if it worked, that might be great. But is it working? When I ran two years ago on the opioid subject, I said that what we needed was to have more counseling, not necessarily more drugs. See, medic, MAT or medically assisted treatment is based on studies, the premise of which is that if you give people suboxone and counseling and support, then they can get off the drugs. But what I found is that in Vermont, actually there's not enough counseling. There is not enough counseling statewide for pregnant addicts. There is almost no support for parents of substance abusers. So the counseling's not there. The drugs are all there. The pharmaceutical company's happy. They're dispensing it everywhere, but there's no counseling. And as a consequence, almost all of the people that I've met who have successfully weaned themselves off of Suboxone or Methadone have done it themselves with almost no support, maybe family support, but certainly not state support. So to only offer half of the equation is a failure to Vermonters. But moreover, I've been studying um, as I've defended the police and talked to corrections officers and probation officers, I've been studying this practice that apparently is true that if you go to prison in Vermont, it started with people were coming in and, and going through detox. So we were going to help people who are heroin addicts by giving them Suboxone. But it seems that that's a pretty gray area because we expanded it. And it, I hear a lot of anecdotal stories and I've written about it and not been told it isn't true, that if you go into a Vermont prison and you're a 21 year old and you're in for six months and you report that you drank some beer and smoked some pot, and now you can have Suboxone if you want. Now you would think in horror that that wouldn't happen. But according to some, if they're not getting Suboxone, uh, then that just shows a failure of the system. Why would you not get Suboxone or Methadone if you were in prison? It's a prison currency, taxpayer funded, my clients were doing this 25, 30 years ago. You get the Suboxone, and then even if it's given to you in your mouth, which they say isn't happening, then you can spit it out, and later it's a prison currency. You can buy weed with it. You can buy protection with it. You can buy sex with it. And it's, it's a currency. And 
why wouldn't you get free currency or even become using Suboxone? If you can't get beer anymore and you can't get weed, you might as well get on Suboxone. And then you get out of prison and you go back and what? Dave Zuckerman wants to give you free housing and a job? Um, you need to earn stuff in life. And this is a moral hazard. And where are, the, where are the services to help people, as promised, to wean themselves off these drugs? If you talk to a lot of people in the recovery community, they treat people who are on Suboxone or Methadone as if they're just going to be on it for the rest of their lives. And there's no real effort to get them off. And I think that is not offering people hope. And I know from talking to people that they want to be off of it. They don't want to be dependent on it, even if it doesn't get them high or just helps them function. Can you imagine without it, you cannot function? Suboxone withdrawal is horrible. And then we get here to the real um, problems. I think we should still have free injection sites just as in the 1980s to prevent the spread of disease and destigmatize it and allow people to have a place where they can get the support, recovery coaches, counseling, therapy, Suboxone, and need be, it's way better than heroin. The fentanyls out there, the fentanyl analogs, can be used to trace where it's manufactured from Mexico all the way up the country. Everywhere somebody dies, you can take their blood, you can test it, and they're all different levels of, of uh, intensity, uh, but they're all unique chemicals. And so you can literally create a map. The feds have a map. So we know it comes from Mexico and China, most of it from Mexico, the real potent stuff from China. And we also know more and more that with, fent with fentanyl strips, I'm not sure how many people want to use them if it isn't to test it to make sure they get the most fentanyl. I have heard from EMTs and other people that if they warn people that a certain strain of heroin is very potent with fentanyl, they'll actually go looking for it. I hope that isn't true, but sadly, I think it is. Are people on Suboxone or Methadone, medically assisted treatment, are they automatically regarded as medically compromised so that they can receive welfare benefits or heating or other or housing benefits more so than people who are not addicted? That's something I'm researching that seems to be why we may have a big shortage of workers in this state. It's some kind of Huxleyan um, dystopian horror that in the, in the um, interest so, so supposedly of rescuing or helping people, we're actually making more and more people dependent on these what? pharmaceutically created synthetic opioids. Does anybody remember how this all started when Peter Welch was investing amongst others in pharmaceutical companies who created drugs that were highly addictive, but were told we, that we're, they were not? Is this not just a different manifestation of that? What's happening in our corrections facilities? Um, is it deliberate to get people on, on that? But here's the big question, because this is the part that's breaking my heart. I've talked to parents who've lost their children. I've talked to children who've lost their parents. But everywhere I'm seeing grandparents and, uh, and foster parents raising young children who've been raised in these households of people who are addicted to heroin or Suboxone or Methadone, who are so narcissistic that the things that these children have to watch and be traumatized by, uh, watching their parents narcanned, watching their parents having sex with strangers or each other, who knows what. These kids are being traumatized in a way that is unprecedented in huge numbers. The system is overwhelmed. So while we hear about during COVID particularly the rise in overdose deaths, do we hear about the children? We want to destigmatize opioids, but maybe we should stigmatize parents who neglect their children, whether they're drunks or gamblers or just narcissists or using drugs. What kind of future generation do we have with these children being subjected to this kind of torn family lives where they're losing both parents, if not to death, to an addiction? These kids are going to be highly at risk of a lot more than just being Suboxone users. Are we creating a future society that will be entirely dependent on the government and pharmaceutical companies for drugs? Who's left to work to pay for it all? That's why I became a recovery coach. That's why Vermonters need to pay more attention to the issues here. And that's why our whole system of medically assisted treatment needs a really hard new look. Thank you for looking at these issues with me. Um, it's horrifying to me how many people as I travel around this state and this county are suffering the effects of this scourge and really how much they're being left on their own, if not the situation being made worse. So it's time to revisit this. That's why I'm running for Senate. And that's why I and others will bring these issues to the table so maybe we can fix them. It's humbling, it's complex, it's not easy, but it's only gonna get worse if we have um, simplistic thinking about the problem. As always, I thank you for listening.